Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. So, source generators. I have a few examples that are working and a few that are not. And we'll just see how far we can get. So, source generators are new in .NET 5. And we covered some .NET 5 features in our, uh, I think it was last month. And it had quite a few interesting features, but I think this was the most interesting one. Um, and so, it may, it may get the juices flowing to think about what we can do with them. Uh, because they're an interesting sort of tool. Um, if you've ever used AOP, you might kind of have an idea what you can do with them, but they're quite a bit different. They work differently than AOP, but they may be able to address certain the same sorts of problems. Here are a few ideas for their use. Uh, the, the, the concept keeps coming up that you can use them to replace reflection in some instances, and reflection is a runtime technology, whereas code generate, source generators are a compile time technology, and so they can have performance benefits at runtime because they don't actually run at runtime. Uh, here are some of the other things that I thought might be interesting to uh, explore with source generators, and uh, surely I'm not the most creative person, and I'm relatively new to them myself, so there, are, there have got to be a lot of useful applications for it. Um, down there at the bottom I've got custom serializers. I note not JSON or XML only because those are already in there. You don't need to reinvent that wheel, but if you had some other type of data conversion that you wanted to do, uh, this might be a really good fit for that. So what are they? Um, here's a quick and easy description, but they are compile time code instead of runtime code, and they output more code. So. Um, I've also called this dynamic hard coding. I thought that was a fun way to try and describe it for those who are having trouble picturing it. Um, I don't know how that just happened. So here is uh, the diagram that Microsoft's documentations provide. Um, normally you'd just step through the blue boxes at the top. Um, you would write some code in Visual Studio and you'd hit Control Shift B and build it. The compiler would run, pick up all your source code and generate the source in IL, and then at some point it may be AOT compiled or JIT compiled and turn into final uh, runtime code. But source generators will intercept the, uh, the the compilation process at the source generator step. They will run your source generator code, produce more source code, and inject that into the compiler process, where the compiler will then resume finish the build, and do the output to IL. So uh, the source generators, of course, are the orange area here and the new part that we'll be exploring. So what do we have to work with? If you're familiar with AOP, I said that they work quite a bit differently. Uh, source generators are much simpler, and they provide two things for you. They allow you to read the source code, and they allow you to generate source code. They do not do what AOP does, where they will weave code into the existing code base. So one of the upsides and the downsides of AOP is that AOP will allow you to inject code into a method at, at various points, depending on which system you're using. Uh, but you can query methods and say, I want to find all methods of this type or with these attributes. And uh, For those, I want to inject uh, a logging at the beginning to say I've entered that method, or logging at the end to say I've exited that method. And the problem with that is you look at your source code and that is actually not the source that you are outputting to your production environment because your AOP just does this magic black box stuff at the end. Well, source generators do that as well, but they will never modify your existing code. They can only ever produce new code. And that new code won't be a mystery because that new code will only ever interact with your code while you're writing it. So it it has it's a it's a lot safer it's a, li a lot less black box and a lot more in hand uh, you you won't find it running out of your control like you would with AOP so that's an important point to make you never modify code with a source generator so here are three categories of things that uh, source generators are often compared to reflection which we talked a little bit about and we'll talk some more about IL weaving is what I'm calling AOP um, code weaving is a more general term for it. IL weaving is specific to .NET, but they do code weaving in Java and other languages as well. And uh, usually they'll use AOP to do the code weaving. A uh, third one, which I it, I think is more a remote 
re uh, related concept is the MS build tasks. So let's say you wanted to uh, uh, AOP is often done as part of the build process because if you're using something like post sharp it's a tool set that you would be applying at build time. Uh, you could do similar things with MS build tasks like obfuscation for example. Uh, these things only ever happen after the build, after the compile. They're not part of the compile process. And so I don't know that it's really applicable to say that you would do the same things with MS build tasks or post build events that you would with code weaving or with source generators because it's not part of the compilation process. So how is it different from reflection? Well, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, reflection is a runtime technology and so this is code that executes when the user actually is running the process. Source generators are a compile time technology. Users never execute these. Developers do. So reflection is relatively slow uh, when you use it for lots of repeated operations. Uh, I, I, I want to make a point here. Uh, reflection is not that slow. You can use reflection. I've met, I've met people who would, would absolutely do things in a strange and silly, ridiculous way just to avoid reflection because they've got it in their head that it's a poor performer. Reflection is many times slower than just using a uh, fixed type code for any given task. And maybe you should avoid it if you can, but most systems we use uh, for our databases these days or for our uh, MVC web, they're all based on reflection and they perform just fine and most of us never look at it and say, oh gosh, this shouldn't be using reflection, it's too darn slow. Reflection works fine until you want to do a million iteration, iterations of something and then you have to optimize it. That's only ever happened to me once in my career. Um, and so uh, reflection is fine to use. Performance is not necessarily something that you need to address with reflection, but it can be. If it is, then source generators may be a good fit. Reflection is based on types, and source generators are not. Source generators get a, an instance of a, a, a representation of your code, not just the types. You can get the types out of it, but you can also actually get the variable names and the string literals and the comments and, and everything that's in there if you want to get those. Um, whereas reflection is only based on types. Reflection is part of your primary code base. That means the part that you actually type out, the code that you put in with your keyboard and you see in Visual Studio. Uh, source generators create part of your primary code base. The source generators themselves are not necessarily part of your primary code base. They're in your projects, but their, their purpose is to be a development tool rather than part of your program. So it's a little bit different to think of it that way. So how is that different from IL weaving? Um, we already talked about that for the most part, but um, AOP is where you would take source and an aspect and you would kind of glue them together with a tool to uh, go and take the output of the compiler, which is the IL, and stick the stuff that the AOP As that the aspect and the source, you know, designate, and put that in the out the already produced IL. Uh, SG will use uh, will will execute before the IL is output. So that's a primary difference. Uh, the other, of course, as I mentioned, is that ALP can modify existing code and source generators cannot. Uh, we talked about post build events too. Uh, build event, uh, sorry, build time events versus compile time elements. So when would I use one? Anytime you would use reflection, anytime you'd use AOP, anytime you'd use AOT code instead of uh, runtime code. Um, the requirements, as I mentioned, are this is a .NET 5 uh, technology, but one of my coworkers who's actually done more of this than I have said he didn't have to install .NET 5, um, that it was just having Visual Studio in there was enough. I haven't gotten into that, and it only matters during the preview, I think. But as Microsoft states, it requires the .NET 5 preview, which is right now it's at preview 7, and the Visual Studio 2019 preview. Uh, once this is released, which will probably be with C Sharp 9, uh, and .NET 5, it'll just be available in regular Visual Studio and regular .NET 5. Uh, the 
current Visual Studio, I think, is 16.7, and the vi current Visual Studio 2019 preview is 16.8. So it, uh, we were talking about it, and it'll be at least uh, 16.9, uh, or maybe the version after that, before it's eligible for a release candidate. But it's really close. However, you know, it, they've done seven, or on preview seven for .NET 5, they've really only done two releases that had any changes to source generators. So there's still quite a bit possibly up in the air with with uh, what they're going to do with it and whether or not they're going to release it at all. Uh, if you look at the documents, half of them are actually proposal documents where they tell you what they've been discussing and what they're considering putting in and how to make it work as opposed to what they've done and how it does work. So it's it's not something that I would base production software off of by any means. So let's get started. I've just typed out the uh, instructions to get your Hello World working on two slides here, and we'll just walk through them as we go. Uh, I have pinned, well, I'll just run it manually, because uh, if I try to run Visual Studio 2019, you can see that I have a regular Visual Studio 2019, and I also have the preview installed side by side. They're very clear about this on the download page that you can install them side by side, and it was very easy to do. I recently installed them both on a new machine, and Visual Studio 2019 with my uh, regular components selected took 36 or 38 gigabytes. The 2019 preview will share the resources for that and so I only had to install five or six gigabytes of downloadable downloaded stuff to install the preview. So it was really easy to put in side by side. So there, it was. Normally, I'm I'm hesitant to download big stuff and install it for when it's just beta stuff, and I'm going to have to uninstall it in a few months. This was really easy. So feel free to pick it up and give it a try. But when you're running this, make sure you run the preview version, not 2019 by accident. So I've actually pinned the preview on my taskbar so that I. Don't type it wrong, I just click on it. So I'm going to start a new project just to show you how it's done. And I'm going to make it uh, a console app. And We'll call it Hello World and put it in the SG Demos directory. Oh, good. I thought it might have gone away. Now, uh, I'm going to add a second project. And it's going to be a C Sharp .NET standard class library, and I'm going to call it Hello World Generator, just to distinguish it. Now it's going to give me a class one, and I'll just rename that to Generator. Now I'll just go back to my instructions here. I want to add NuGet packages, and these are the two that I need. Pardon me while I fumble my way through the package manager. Okay, now I have what probably builds. Good. Now I need to add a special kind of reference to this assembly from my console application. And I'm going to start by just adding a project reference and pay attention to what happens over here.
So it put this item group with a project reference in there, and that's mostly complete. It's just an easy way to start. On my second page here, you can see that I also need to add these two guys, which I thought I could cut and paste, but I can't. And there's no insight here. You'll note that in all of the documents you try to look into for source generators, uh, everyone complains that the tooling is pretty weak. Reference output assembly equals false. I'll save that. And I'm going to, you'll note that I'm doing a rebuild solution every single time. I wouldn't normally do that, but where source generators are concerned, that's the way I've found that it needs to be done. It just does not overwrite your, your previous builds if you don't do a rebuild. Uh, other people's experience may vary. I didn't think on my other machine that it was behaving that way, but I didn't do much with it. I could be wrong. But that's what I found on my machine, so that's what I'll be doing. Um, it's not for nothing. So now I have a generator, and there's nothing in here. I need to build a generator class. So going back to my uh, first page, it points out that I need to write a class that implements iSource generator, and I need to give it a generator attribute. So, easy enough. It doesn't know the namespace, so I'll add it. And that's the right one. I'll put it where it belongs. I'll implement the interface. It gives me two methods. So for my hello world, I can pretty much ignore the initialize. So I'll just take that out. And here I'll do an implementation. Now, we get this context uh, parameter, and the context parameter is, um, our, is uh, gives us everything we need. It will give us the uh, representation of the source code that has already been, that's already been compiled, and it gives us a way to output new source code into it. So, if I look at context.compilation, this is where I can get a representation of the compiled source code. If I want to output new source code, I can say uh, compilation. Uh, that's not what I want to do. I want to add source from the context directly. And I can say there's a hint name parameter here. And this is really important. It sounds like it's not, but it is. If you output, if you call add source more than once, it's going to need to put your source code that you're producing into actual files. Uh, just to do its job, and it uses this hint name to determine what those file names should be. And the only reason it's called a hint name is because if you do something silly because you don't understand how the thing works, it reserves the right to override that name and use whatever it has to. But if everything goes right, this will actually be the file name that gets generated. You probably would never encounter it unless you have a problem and have to go digging, but make it a good hint name nonetheless. So if I were to produce a, a class named my custom hello world I would put it in a file named my custom hello world .cs. so it's not a bad way to go to just say that's the name of my class that would be the name of my file right but I wouldn't put on the .cs just a name so it needs to be unique within this generator so if I output multiple ad sources then uh, I need those to be unique among those add sources just in this execute method. So the second parameter is a source text. I can say source text dot um, I need to add that namespace and then I can say source text dot from and I can give it a string that contains source code. So that's really easy. I'm going to say um, uh, I'm, I've made up that SB. It's going to be a string builder in a moment. Bear with me. 
And then this looks like an optional parameter, but I found that it's not so optional. It'll compile, but it, but it really requires it. So I'm just going to encoding .utf if utf8. Okay. So that should build. But note when I do a build here, this is actually compile time code. And so it executed this actual code. It didn't just build it, it executed it. And so whenever you have a source builder, a source generator, you need to know that your builds are going to be executing this code. Uh, if you're writing code, what m might be considered properly, it's probably not a problem. But it's it, it might help you to think about how you should be writing that code if you bear that in mind. So I'm going to write an actual um, class here. Oh, well, that's my problem. Okay, I'm going to save it, but I'm going to come up here and do a rebuild instead of just Control shift b like I normally would. And I see that 2 succeeded and 0 failed. So my generator did build and did run this code. And that's interesting because that means that it, it output this class and added it to my compilation. So I should be able to come up here and get rid of that default stuff and say hello world dot hello world. But it says that I can't do that. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to rebuild And it tells me that hello world does not exist in that namespace just like it looked like. And I'm going to, I just, I just saved, I'm going to restart Visual Studio. hasn't changed. Um, I have always had to do that. Did I add this reference? Yeah, I did add the reference. It should show up there. Uh, this, when you add the uh, those special lines to the csproj file, this is this should be the result. It should show up under analyzers instead of projects. Well, I haven't had this problem yet. Let's skip real fast to the working project. Because this is next in line anyway. I did the string builder a little bit differently in here, but just the dumb way I was kind of building it. Um, but it works the same way. I've built that string builder. I call to string and pass it into add source. And I've just used different names here. Static hello is the namespace and hello world is the class. But then 
here in the program, I have, oh, that's not the right one. I have a new class, or sorry, a, a generated class, hello world, in the static hello namespace. So that's the one that I generated. And it does build. Okay. So now it's built, and I should be able to run it. And I've hit my breakpoint, and this is actually running. So. I can debug this part because it's runtime code. And here's my output, just as we expect. But I wanted to uh, I wanted to show you one other thing here, and that is what happens if I set a breakpoint on compile time code? When would that even run? Right? Um, it certainly doesn't run when I hit F5. We never hit that. So this is compile time code. It runs when I go like this. But would that hit my breakpoint? If we think about it, what is debugging? It's an analysis of runtime code at runtime. This is compile time code. There's no runtime going on here. So we can't set breakpoints and debug uh, compile time code. And let's not confuse that with our ability to debug the output from that generator. This hello world contains code that we should be able to debug. Uh, I'm actually going to get brave here because I have not tried this. This is not something that they had available right away. It's something that they wanted to do, but I don't know if it's in this preview or not. So I'm going to step in to um, say hello. Will you look at that? So we can debug into the generated code. And just for fun, we can see where that file is. And it's in temp. Now this is not where it told me that it was going to be. And that's just because it's been uh, uh, decompiled, I think. We're supposed to be able to find this in a folder um, well, I've got a slide for it. I'll show it to you when we get to that slide. But there's a place where we can find this generated output, and this is what it would look like. So we can see the source. We can debug the source at runtime. And those are both pretty good victories for the second version of a preview. Okay, let's stop that. And I want to move to uh, a second kind of demonstration of this runtime versus compile time concept. So I'm going to go back here and re-enable this code. And I have a second generator in here, generator from template. And this does something squarely. And of course you would never want to do this, but I wanted to show it off. Uh, in here I have a file name that points to this compile time template uh, file. And this is in my solution, and that contains a hello world class. Uh, it, there's no namespace on this one, but regardless. It's going to try to load that from... Uh, first, I tried to just load it from the current directory, thinking it's in the output folder, right? I told it to copy always, or copy if newer, and so I should be able to do that. Of course, I can't set a breakpoint here, so that makes it really hard to debug these things, because you can't debug you know, you can't actually attach a debugger and step through it at compile time. So there are very few things that you can do, but here's one that's built in. Uh, this context I mentioned gives you all kinds of things. One of the things that it gives you is a report diagnostic method. And the report diagnostic method will let you send a compiler error to the compiler output. And so here is some code to do that. Um, so when I run this, I'll get an error, and you can see my error right here that I produced. My ID123 is right here, and so I can put in very de detailed and interesting messages in here. Uh, one thing that I noticed was it has parameters for things that I don't usually pay too much attention to, 
uh, for example, the category right here. There's, you can right click on here to go to show columns and category isn't even visible on my default. So I can click on it and it shows up right here, but my category value didn't show up in there. So these, not all of these parameters are necessarily as useful as they sound, but, but they're all there. And I can set this, of course, to warn or error or info as I decide. But this is probably your best tool for debugging these things, or at least making them, you know, you should probably be putting them in there to make good solid code anyway. But I can see that this file does not exist. Now, why doesn't that exist? Uh, it's right here, and I copied it. In fact, if I go to... Uh, I'm just going to open that folder. If I go to the bin debug net standard 20, there's my file right there in my output folder. So you quickly realize that this is not actually the directory that it's looking at for its output. Let's have a look at the object browser. So if I look for the, the assemblies in my project, I find them both right here. And here is Hello World and Program. And here's Generator and Generator from Template. So Hello World is just as you would expect, actually, in Static Hello. But look, I, don't, I didn't put it there in my solution. This was generated. But it was generated from this assembly. Uh, sorry. It was generated from this assembly. And it exists in this namespace in this assembly. So it seems that it's looking for that file in the output folder for this. Is that correct? So I don't know. I start looking at different paths and I see that if I hard code this thing just like this, which of course is terrible, I find that if it builds, it must exist there. And it does actually exist at this path. So this path is for uh, the static hello generator. I don't know why it doesn't find it at this location, but I start fiddling around with it and realize, oh, well, duh. If I watch that directory that we just opened up, let me see if I can fit them both on the screen here. I don't know if it'll actually show it or not, but I can just tell you what's happening. These files get wiped out and regenerated when you build, right? So I'm looking for that file in this directory, but it got deleted when I started my build, and it's just not there. It's there at some point during the compilation because this copy always tells it to be, but it's not there at the right time. So. Bear that in mind that if you're doing anything with some of these resources, you're not going to be able to just access those directly. So there is a way to do that that's proper. And I haven't fiddled with this, but here in the context, there is, I think it's additional files. And this will give you access to non-code files that can be used by generators. Uh, like I said, I, I don't really even know for sure what's in it. I just kind of wanted to go through all the members of context to have some idea when we get in here uh, and show you uh, that it's available if you want to do, some, do something silly like work with a compile time template.txt file. So uh, that covers that. Let me have a look at the comments here, catch up. Uh, you were pointing out the class name can't be in the same as the namespace. Uh, that was something that I did do uh, in in one place and not the other. I did. I was aware of that. I'm not presenting it very well. Um, you want to try a debugger dot break? Where would you try that? Oh, 
Dan points out that you can hit the breakpoint in the generator if you debug Visual Studio and attach from another Visual Studio instance. That's true. That could be messy, but uh, I don't think it would be too bad. I probably should have tried that a few times. Anyhow, uh, that's good to know. Okay, I think that's the last comment right now. Let's move on to the next demonstration. Uh, what we've done so far is, you remember, we just have two abilities in source generators. We can read the representation of the code base and we can output new code. We've output new code and there's not a whole lot to that that I've found. Uh, most of the complexity that I encountered was in trying to read the representation of the source code. So there's a normal proper uh, parser tree that it passes you and I have um, I have a nearly working demo of that. I'm kind of embarrassed but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. What I wanted to do was take uh, my hello world and I wanted to make it so that I could add something like this at the beginning and then have it generate a class that looked like that, which you can do, it just doesn't quite work. Uh, but that was the goal. So this is commented out right now because of course it's not valid until it works. But I have generated, uh, sorry, I've created a generator and I created the, this generate for attribute, which is pretty self-explanatory. I put it in this third assembly because both this guy and this guy need to see it and I don't know if that's the right way to go or not but that's how I found it to work and that's probably how I would do it normally in a project that I'm trying to architect properly so he's in another assembly and he just has the one property name and I can pass it into the constructor here uh, so it's specified on the attribute itself uh, one thing that's important to know about attributes they work I think they will work very well with source generators because they both kind of have something in common and that is attributes have always been compile time stuff. You you were never able to do something like this. It won't compile because you've just put runtime code into an attribute and attributes are compile time code. So where we're talking about compile time code and compile time code they should work together very well. Uh, you can only use constants, literals, and things like that uh, as expressions in these attributes. So attributes might be a good way to decorate your code and trigger things in your, in your source generators. So here I have a source generator, and it's a big old mess, but let's have a look at it. Uh, the, the first thing we, we find in here is, in the context, we have a compilation object, which I mentioned is how you get your hands on the representation of, the, of your source code, and it has uh, dot syntax trees member and if I go through that uh, syntax trees and I just dumped them to a file let me show you what that looked like if I still have it um, there we go so it's interesting to note that this is not always the order that I get them in. Frequently program.cs is at the top of the list and now it's not. So if I go and change my program at some point it caused it to do this in a different order. So you don't want to reference these things by index unless you really know what's uh, how it works or what you know that you're only gonna have one of these but I wouldn't bank on that. So be careful which ones of these you're working with by name or by some other attribute on the uh, the syntax tree object. So this is the one that represents this folder over here, or sorry, this file over here. And if I go and I'll show you the code in a second here, but as I walk through that code, I can see each of these elements in it because it's gone and tokenized them, put them into a parser, and then passed the syntax tree from that parser to me. The problem that I have is just that I'm not doing something right when I walk that tree. So over here in this uh, uh, execute method, I go and I get the trees and I go and find the one that ends in program CS and I get the right one. I find that it's not null 
and then console.write line. I didn't think that would work. I don't know what it would do, but I just found an example on the web that does this and thought, why not? If somebody is watching this presentation, they will surely want to know what that will do and if it's useful. I can't see anywhere that it outputs that, but whatever. Maybe someone knows better. Uh, anyway, uh, this would you know, be more useful than uh, the diagnostic report that we showed before because that actually produces a compiler output error warning or info. Uh, you could use the info. Uh, it would just be kind of uh, verbose to, to write all of those. Uh, I did a silly little workaround that I'll show you with just some output to files like this, which is not a good way to go, but I'm just still trying to figure it out. Anyhow, uh, there are three ways that I found that you can, that are kind of built in for you to navigate the syntax tree. And there may be more, but I've just found the three to be, you know, popular in, in uh, where, across the web where people are asking questions. Uh, there's a class visitor which um, I created and it's in, it's a descendant of the symbol visitor. So the first one is symbol visitor and this is your regular visitor pattern and I find this to be uh, the same as a visitor that, that you would be gen that would be generated by the antler 4 if you're familiar with that or uh, probably by any other compiler generators you've used. And this is mostly working for me. The two others, I've got them in a slide. Uh, let's, let's have a look at those slides and see if I've missed anything anyway. It's probably a good time to go over those. So these are the two namespaces that, I, that I've had to add to mine. And they, it would be interesting to go and explore through those. I haven't had a chance to go through them all the way. And here are the classes that I'm talking about. There's a C-sharp syntax walker, a C-sharp syntax rewriter, and a symbol visitor. And these are all different ways of navigating that syntax tree so that you can get your hands on what you're looking for from the source code. So if you want to look for tokens, you might use the syntax walker. If you want to uh, use, if you want to find namespaces or types, you might want to use the symbol visitor. If you want to use anything else, you may look at the rewriter. And um, the symbol visitor was appropriate for me because I'm looking for attributes, and those are types. Uh, they're, at, they're attributes applied to a class, and a class is a type. So. I've made my visitor and I override, it, let's, let's have a look at this real quick, I wanted to show you. If I come to uh, generate overrides, you know, it, it gives me this dialog where I can pick the ones that I want. I don't need all of these, but these are what are available and there are quite a few. So if I want to visit um, a discard or visit an event or visit a class, there's no class here I was surprised to find. Um, but you know the reason for that is because it doesn't do uh, this type and that type and all the other types it does a visit named type which I've already overridden so it's not in here but um, uh, there's a visit namespace and a visit named type and those are what I would use to get my hands on those particular elements in the syntax tree so those are the only ones I had to override uh, in fact visit namespace I'm not sure I need that at all what I'm looking for is the class and I find that uh, it, this this should get visited for every type. And the first thing I need to do is just to make sure that the type that I got is a class. And if it's not, I just ignore it. And then it seems that I need to tell it to visit all of the children as well. The walker, there's, there's some differ, differing information, some conflicting information out there as to whether or not the walker actually will visit all of the members without me going and telling it to visit all of the children. So I've put it in here and it didn't seem to make any difference either way, but right now this is the closest to what I'm trying to do, so I've left it in there. Uh, this this was just generated by Visual Studio and I thought that would be enough, but uh, I don't know which is more correct at this point. So back up to here, I know that I have a class type that's been passed to me on this visit, and I can take the the uh, get attributes method and kind of go from there. So I know that I'm getting the attributes. Um, I have another another file here that I output to. Oh, uh, oh I'm glad it's still there. So the first the first thing I did was I logged that I created the visitor, and then. I logged 
the the type that was passed to me and for any type that's a class I go and look for the attributes so the first one that was passed to me was actually my program class which is what I was looking for and then it found the uh, generate for attribute which is the one I'm looking for so this really is 99 percent of the way there I'm just doing something silly after the fact but uh, you know it goes and shows me all the other places that it visits and I can ignore most of it but if I were to go fix just this part uh, this whole thing would work so uh, getting the, const the constructor parameters out of that attribute would be enough for me to know which hello worlds we wanted to generate for and I already have uh, a generator for that here in the generator world uh, generate hello world source code method it takes a string name and it'll pass it into the I didn't actually write it to change the class name I could ch write it to change the class name but instead I just told it to change the output which is less useful but I, I, I can do it either way um, <clears throat> so if I can get past that one last hurdle this whole thing would work like this and it would output hello fill and so that's a better example of what you would want to do with this rather than just outputting a static hello world class because you might as well just write that in your primary code base uh, the idea behind a source generator is that, that it can take additional output or inputs and generate output that saves you typing and so this sort of thing would do it so I could take uh, you know a bunch of these and just generate whole classes just from each one of those uh, that's gonna have to be dealt with but that can be done so that's where I'm stuck at this point and that's as far as my presentation probably goes until we're through the rest of the the uh, slides here uh, I've just put some things in here for reference in case anybody's going to tinker with this uh, here's the hello world sample that I built that we just went over um, <clears throat> we let's see if we've talked about all of these yeah we do get in we showed you IntelliSense oh uh, it's it needs to be noted that generators can be shipped via NuGet uh, they specified that however uh, my coworker determined that that wasn't working just yet so then we may need more information or we may need a revision I don't know which uh, we showed you the object browser so I think that covers all of that and we talked about debugging and compile time uh, what's limited in the preview uh, always do a rebuild I mentioned that and whenever you create a new generator I've had to restart my Visual Studio IDE and so uh, I haven't had too much trouble with that uh, you know once I kind of figured out where I have to do it if once you create a new generator restart the IDE every other time do a rebuild whenever you make a change to your generator and everything seems to work swimmingly although my live demo of course didn't work because that's just the course of nature uh, as far as uh, well I put these in too they're probably not in the best order I should have covered these first but for those who haven't I imagine everybody's used reflection but just in case anybody hadn't this is the code that it would take just to call a method uh, with two parameters that you got off of the same object its properties which it, it's a contrived example you probably would never need to do that the object itself should have encapsulation and, and know how to do that but uh, just to call a method with two properties from this person object whose type is not necessarily known but whose members are assumed to be known it's quite a bit of code and so it's not just it it's kind of ugly it's kind of hard to read it's more than kind of hard to maintain and it's not type safe so it's prone to bugs uh, and it's a little bit slow for lots and lots of operations but this is what it looks like uh, I didn't talk about partial classes uh, a lot of the things that you're going to find useful in here probably will 
require a little bit of creativity in how to take the code that you output and make it interact with the code that you've written by hand. And one of the things that seem really easy to do, and I've seen in a lot of examples, is to use partial classes. So if, for example, I wanted to add not just a, a class that I consume in here, but instead add something like a med, uh, method, uh, let's, let's say I went and did something like this. And so now I've got this object, and I want to add a, just some method that does something here. This is a little bit harder to do because I've, I'm trying to mix code with an existing class and a generated piece of code. And so what you would probably end up doing is making this a partial class. And the generator, of course, would put this in another file which is also a partial for that same class and so that they can kind of glue together. Uh, it, it, ignore the tabs and the spaces. I've gone through, this is the preview install, I think there's something wrong with it. I went and changed them to use tabs and it just will not. It's mixing and it's goofed up, just bear in mind that I hate that and I would never allow this to happen normally. Uh, Anyway, so here's an example of how partial classes kind of glue two files together for the same class. And that can be useful for generation, not just for source generators, but for any kind of generation I've found. Uh, here is what the iSource generator looks like. Of course, we generated, we, we use the Visual Studio tool to implement it automatically for us. Uh, but there it is for reference. And the source generator context, uh, these are the ones that we need to go and uh, get familiar with if we want to be serious about this, but there's the compilation object and the report diagnostic object that I was able to show you and the add source that we use for creating new source for the uh, compilation process. Uh, the cancellation token I haven't done anything with and the syntax receiver. Uh, the syntax receiver is important and I wish I'd had time to cover it, but you know obviously we didn't need it to do quite what we were doing, but you know, before you end up doing too much with this, you'll probably need to uh, go and look at the syntax receiver and see see what it does, so that you know when to use it and when not to. Uh, here's the location of the generated files that I was talking about. Uh, this is where they tell us that they can be found. I haven't looked at this, so once again, getting brave. But let's see if we can. Actually, I still have that open here. Let's see if we can find that. I'm not finding that. I, I don't know what they're talking about, but that's what they say. It should be under generated files. So it's got to be in there somewhere. Uh, I also talked about the hint. So the, the hint that you use when you call dot add source should be the basis of what it puts in here. So put that back up here. Uh, and here are the, res the, these are mostly the, the official resources. These are uh, the GitHub doc, the uh, documents in the GitHub repository where this is hosted, where this is uh, published by Microsoft. So these are what I used and there are probably better resources out there really. Uh, these are initial stuff, but they are pretty complete. Um, they're, Everything else that I found out there is mostly just a copy of this. That uh, chart that I, or the uh, diagram that I put in one of my early uh, slides, it's straight out of that document, and everybody else has got the same one. So it, this is the, the right place to start. And that's my last slide. So let's see if there are any other questions. It's going to be a short one, but uh, I hope that it showed enough that. Uh, that it that it can get you started or get you interested at least. Um, cool. Well, Dan says he's not having too much trouble debugging Visual Studio with de with Visual Studio, so that's cool. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Any suggestions for next month's meeting? 
we uh, we have plans for our October meeting. We're not sure how we're going to do an online meeting for our Halloween presentation, but any comments are welcome, any suggestions are welcome, and any volunteers are welcome. But for September, uh, somebody mentioned, I think they mentioned, I don't know if they mentioned uh, Maui or if they mentioned the uh, the other UI library, I can't think of it right now. But uh, if anybody has tinkered with either one, they're welcome to present. Uh, they don't even have to come to the meeting. They can do it in, do it at home like I'm doing. We have a list of other things to present if somebody wants to just get their feet wet presenting and needs us to give them an idea. I rather doubt that myself. So, I'm still not seeing anything. I guess we'll wrap this up. I thank everybody for coming. I want to mention our sponsors. Uh, Mindfire's presented us with pretty much everything we use to do this. And so far. And uh, we thank them for that. If anybody is looking for work, you can find them on the web. Uh, or contact us at uh, the new NUNUG um, uh, Slack server. And we'll hook you up with some work. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure they're looking. I guess they're always looking. And they'll take people with all manner of expertise. So let them know. So that's it. Thanks for coming.